Well, again, as I was saying, uh, there's nothing that brings joy to my heart than to see us coming into a book, these books, Ezra and Nehemiah, which is a great uh, sign of God's hope and revelation of his fulfilling of his promises, his faithfulness in keeping his promises. To look now to see that we are saved only because of the righteousness of Christ and nothing of our own doing. This is really what we get through these two books, uh, from the singing to the praying to the worshiping of God, the gathering in the presence of God, when a people were left in their helplessness or were in a state of helplessness and hopelessness, that God would restore a people unto himself. And uh, again, it brings joy to my heart because the Lord Jesus has restored a people unto himself. And uh, these two books um, really cry out the gospel of Christ in such a way that uh, we who are living today in Christ should rejoice as we look back to these books like Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, before we dive into them, I just would like to do a review by asking you, uh, what do you remember from reading the Chronicles last Friday? Uh, as it's of great importance in entering Ezra and Nehemiah, what uh, do you recall in our study of the book of Chronicles uh, when we went through it together? Uh-oh. Maybe I should start printing those uh, Q&A tests again, eh? <laughs> oh, they'll come back. Uh, I guess, uh, let me narrow it down since the book of Chronicles is quite wide. Uh, what do you remember in the latter part of the second Chronicles uh, where we left off? Where did we leave off? Mm -hmm. How it was how they're to come back, and and then that's how kind of Ezra and Nehemiah enters in. And right. So them. God would use a pagan king, the king of Medo Persia, King Cyrus. And what exactly did God do in that man's heart? He he softened it. He softened it. To to. Let the people go back, mm -hmm. uh, right. return from their captivity. Yeah, to return back to the uh, from their captivity, uh, to be re a restored community. And what was really the intention of the writer uh, or the chronicler when he was writing the book of Chronicles? Remember, I had emphasized the difference of his intention compared to the author and the writer of Kings. Uh, what was the intention of the chronicler when writing these things? Proclaiming the hope of Israel. Rem proclaiming the hope of Israel. God's faithfulness to them despite how far they had fallen. Okay, yeah, yeah. And exactly, and what was in the thought or perhaps what was in the mind of these people during that time for which why the writer wrote this? If they were still his people, yeah. But they were constantly rebelling, right? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, to the point where the Lord took them into captivity through the uh, pagan mm -hmm. nations. Right. And so... Um, but what was the point of the chroniclers uh, bringing that to the atten attention of his audience? Well, his faithfulness to his promises. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sorry, I'm... Remember, the audience at that time were those post-exilic people. They were the ones coming back. And at the time of this chronicler, they were thinking in their hearts, are we still God's people? Are we still part of his covenant? And we remember that during Babylonian captivity, all of those sacred writings or majority of them were burned and destroyed. And so these people are returning with a very blurred vision. Does God still love us? We are delivered, we're back home, but what now? And so the, the writer of the Chronicles brings us back as far as who? 
Adam, right? He goes as far as Adam, not even Moses, but not even Abraham, all the way back to Adam to remind them that they are God's people made in his image and likeness, but even favored by God, the children of Abraham, and even despite the rebellion. You see, at the end of the book, we don't see a conquering Israeli king with a sword. All of those kings fell. What we see is what Sister Rika mentioned, God's sovereignty in turning the heart of a pagan king to line up with his will in redeeming his people unto himself. And so, uh, as we get into Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, how many of you have read the book of Ezra and Nehemiah before? Yes. What do you recall uh, of the truths proclaimed in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah? Now, there are a lot of truths that we can talk about. And tonight, really, uh, we do not have enough time. I mean, just speaking of the leadership mentioned in these two books alone uh, is a whole entire sermon series. Just the way that Ezra and Nehemiah was led of God to bring reformation in the minds of his people, of, of, their, of their people in those days, um, is, is, is a complete uh, sermon series on its own. But uh, ultimately, what do you recall seeing in Ezra and Nehemiah when you were reading it in the past? Uh, Ezra doesn't come to mind quickly, but Nehemiah is the return of the people rebuilding uh, the wall, the temple. And um, and how Nehemiah's prayer, <coughs> Nehemiah's prayer, is mm -hmm. at the beginning of, of of being able to do that. that and what was the, Nehemiah's prayer? It, it, for, uh, the, for the Lord to help them rebuild, rebuild, and that they would be faithful right. to stick to it, right, right, Amen. And, and glorify Him in doing so. Mm -hmm. Anyone else with any other thoughts? Fasting and praying. Fasting and praying. Well, uh, exactly it. There's, it's the, uh, it comes with the great subject of rebuilding. Uh, but further than just walls and temples, altars, um, service. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, yes, it's about rebuilding, but there's something ultimately that it's pointing to that it must be rebuilt, and that is the heart of man. Um, after being lost in the fall, Ezra and Nehemiah rebuild a lot of things, or at least the contents of it speak of the rebuilding of many things. But ultimately, it points to the ultimate rebuilding, the ultimate restoration that one has with God. And tonight we move on to those two books, and these two books are often viewed separately, but just like the series or the sets of books that we've talked about uh, over the last couple of Fridays, uh, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah by the ancient Hebrews have considered this one book. Um, the reason being, and though they did not live, um, at, at, and when I say this, uh, when their ministry took place, they may not have been in the same place from the beginning. Um, they may not have been under the same administration at the same time, uh, the Persian administration, the Persian king. Uh, but the reason why the ancient Hebrews brought Ezra and Nehemiah together, uh, number one, because it fit their Hebrew alphabet when it, uh, when it came to the count of the Old Testament canon, uh, but also because Ezra and Nehemiah both speak of that post-exilic time. And not just the post-exilic time, but the community being restored to God. And so this is why these two are brought together. Um, thirdly, because it is believed that Ezra is the author of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, and First and Second Chronicles. And so this is uh, the reason why it is uh, taken as one. Now, again, they both record the last events 
of the Old Testament. Remember last Friday I'd mentioned to you that the Chronicles are the last books of the ancient um, Hebrew canon. And uh, it is believed that Ezra and Nehemiah were written before First and Second Chronicles. And so the events are, uh, if, sh if indeed is Ezra is the writer, uh, Ezra has such great passion to lead the people of God in understanding what God intended and what God spoke and revealed from the start, that as they are being restored, this is what they ought to be restored in. And so we've already gone through the Chronicles, and the book of Ezra and Nehemiah uh, continue that for us with great detail. Um, and through a narrative form versus a more historic, um, jotted down, detailed format, as we see uh, in the Kings or in the Chronicles. Now, at the end of the Chronicles, again, we were left with the hope, the theme of hope, as the king of Persia, Cyrus, Cyrus would be stirred up by God to initiate the restoration of God's people to return to their land and to receive back, again, the promise of God to their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so God is using a pagan king um, and we end off the Chronicles with hope. And now as we enter Ezra and Nehemiah, the theme that these two books bear is God's unfailing promises. Now, it's one thing to speak of hope, but these two books put us in the driver's seat to see the actual experience of these people seeing God's unfailing promises unfold before their very own eyes. They are no longer hoping for it. They are now experiencing it with their own lives. And so again, we ended off Chronicles in the, with the thought of hope. King of Persia is stirred by God. And now Ezra and Nehemiah is the fulfillment of God's unfailing promises. In other words, these two books tell us that no one can stop God from fulfilling what he promised. Amen? Nothing can stop God from fulfilling what he promised. Now, why is that big? Because again, uh, we ended off Chronicles not with the thought that there were righteous kings. We ended off Chronicles knowing that there was a decline after that last mentioned king, uh, the last four kings mentioned there. It just went into a decline before captivity. And this is big because God does not fail in keeping his promises. Um, he is stronger than the depravity of, or the, the, that, the depravity that is in the hearts of these unrighteous kings. Um, if you think and consider about the mega powers that lived during those days, like Babylon, Babylon which conquered, you say, the entire region, the entire land, lands. No one could defeat Babylon, but yet God took down Babylon. It may not have been by the hands or in the hands of Israel, but God would raise an army of a different nation to overthrow the army of the Chaldeans, the Babylon, or the Babylonians. And the next mega power that would rise would be the Medo-Persians. And the Medo-Persians were feared around the entire world. Who can overcome such a great nation? But just as God dethroned the powers of Babylon, he would also rule over the king of Persia. And God would use Cyrus to become a sense or a sort of a mediator in speaking and inviting God's people back to return to their ways. Surely, as the book of Proverbs, I've sent this verse to you last week uh, after we had left, but Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is a stream in the hand of the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. Amen. No man, no nation, no power on earth or above can stop God from fulfilling his promises to his people. This is the theme of Ezra and Nehemiah. And we are sort of like the people in Ezra and Nehemiah's days. 
Because in their helpless state, God would restore. We, today, remember our helpless state, our hopeless state without Christ, in sin lost, but restored, forgiven. And we, in a sense, are like the people of Ezra and Nehemiah's day, but with greater promises, and we see them with our very own eyes and are living the great promises of God to Abraham through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, again, this is why it brings such joy in my heart to go back into such a book that reminds us that nothing can stop God's promises. And certainly we know this because we have experienced Christ our Lord. And this salvation that we have today testifies that God indeed does not fail. And certainly, uh, remember the state of the people in the Chronicles. If the kings were wicked, then the nation was wicked. They often fell into idolatry. And I told you that certain section of the Old Testament that is run by nothing but disappointment. Even in the period of the judges, in the period of the kings, disappointment. Why? Because after the people would repent, they would go back and turn to idols. There's this cycle of going back to idolatry. But listen, Ezra and Nehemiah is not just hope, but Ezra and Nehemiah bring forth to us God's power in changing men's hearts. Because up to this point, it almost seems like there's no hope for Israel. These depraved people that often go and follow unrighteous kings and turn to Baal and offer their children unto Moloch. How could these people ever be changed? But the contents of Ezra and Nehemiah revealed to us that God is not only faithful to keep his promise, but God is powerful to even change hearts. Because you will see a complete change of direction from the people who lived in the past compared to the people of these days. And so certainly the faithfulness of God is demonstrated here when the nation you'll read later turns itself back to God and it's not God calling them, but they running to God voluntarily and freely, seeking after his face, seeking to build for themselves an altar. Then he, desiring and hungering to hear from, uh, hear the words of scripture. And not returning to their idolatrous ways of the past, at least. This is a turning point, and really this, these books in uh, redemptive history, again, are the latter por portions of the Old Testament before we reach that 400 years of silence before the Gospels. And so these, this is the turning point. Uh, God is showing us something great here. There is hope, and uh, not just in the restoration of a people back to where they belong, but something greater is coming. And again, the theme is God's unfailing promises. God saves, God changes hearts. That's what we see in this book. Now, a lot of the content we will go through as we uh, speak on the structure of both Ezra and Nehemiah. And beginning with Ezra, uh, this is for you to note down as we go through the sections together. So from chapters 1 to 6, Verse 19, we have the, what you call, the return of the exiles. The return of the exiles, or you could say the first return of the exiles, because there are multiple waves that come later. The first return of the exiles and the building of the second temple. Or you could say the rebuilding of the temple. And so that's what um, is spoken of from chapters 1 to 6, verse 19. The return of the first wave of exiles and the rebuilding of the temple. <clears throat> now, the book of Ezra begins where the book of Chronicles ends. And if you were just to open your Bibles here in Ezra chapter 1, and uh, we will read from verse 1 to 11, <clears throat> you will see that the train of thought that was left in, in 2 Chronicles 23, or sorry, 2 Chronicles 36, 23, is where we pick up on in 
Ezra 1. Ezra 1, 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem, and let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred up or stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares. Besides all that was that all that was freely offered, Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Cyrus, king of Persia, brought these out in the charge of Mithridath, the treasurer who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. And this was the number of them, 30 basins of gold, 1,000 basins of silver, 29 censers, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, and a thousand other vessels. All the vessels of gold and of silver were 5,400. All these did Shesh Bazar bring up when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. Amen. And so we pick up, and first and foremost, what we need to consider is that what you don't read at the end of Second Chronicles 36 is brought here in Ezra chapter 1. And what I love and what we should not miss is the fact that Cyrus did not just verbally give this decree, but had it in writing because this writing would be of benefit later on when their opposers would come and uh, deny and, and desire a ceasing of the building of the temple. And uh, later on, you will read that King Darius would go back into the files and documents of King Cyrus and he finds this decree in writing. And he says, the ceasing or the uh, desire to stop the Jews from rebuilding should end. They ought to continue. And again, there is, an, there is that noted down in chapter 1 as the document is provided as well. Of the decree of God. Not just in a, on a document, but even given to the entire nation. That this is God's will. Uh, an entire pagan nation would hear that the covenant God of Israel is bringing his people back. That they would not grow to oppress the Jews um, in their dominance uh, all over the world. As they are reigning and ruling over most lands, the Persians are not to come against the people of God who are returning to their land. And so, uh, we see they hear in chapter 1 the... Uh, very working of God in the heart of King Cyrus. And certainly as scripture tells us that the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord and he directs it wherever he wills. That in itself shows us that even when in the minds of the Jews they had no idea what God was doing, God was certainly working. It is a reminder to us in, redemptive, in the redemptive uh, story of God in scripture that when men's minds are limited and their thoughts are limited, and their hopes of God are far away and gone, God is always actively working uh, to fulfill His purposes and promises unto His people. And so that's what we have here. And now a decree is sent, and the people of God are preparing to return. And so in chapter 2, uh, you see the first wave of Jewish exiles coming back uh, to Jerusalem, And you will read three notable characters that God displays his faithfulness through. And the first of them is found in chapter 2. His name is Zerubbabel. And his name means to be born in Babel. 
or birthed out of Babel. Um, another way of saying it is raised in Babel. That's important uh, when considering the Gospels because Zerubbabel leading the exile. Now Zerubbabel is in exile himself, but him used, being used of God to bring the exiles back. His name means born in Babel, which is a great representation of sinners in a helpless and hopeless state. God would use to lead his people back to the land given to them. And so that's what you see in chapter 2, the return of the exiles under Zerubbabel. And you have a large list. And again, people are often dismayed when they read Ezra and Nehemiah because you see portions of it where genealogies are written down and uh, account of uh, the second wave or the third wave of exiles that come back. And so they often skip the names and the numbers the counts of people, but if you're thinking on the subject of restoration, it's a, those names and numbers are another way of saying that these are the names of those who have been restored to God. Uh, it is similar to what you see in the book of Revelation when we are introduced to something called the book of life and uh, names that are written in God's holy book. And again, you see those pictures even brought out and the importance of genealogies, the importance of account and number of people um, is to say that these are the people that God had brought back again to himself. Uh, just one day as he comes back to judge the earth and judges his saints and receives them into glory, he will call you by name because our names are written in his book of life. And we are considered by God himself and by divine inspiration, the Holy Spirit of God had written placed in the heart of Ezra to write these things that the people of God would be encouraged that your families, your fathers and mothers, these are their names and these are the ones that God brought back. Are we understanding that this evening? And that is of great importance. And so there's, first of all, Zerubbabel, the leader, the first leader of the uh, return to Jerusalem. And as they return, really, uh, at the end, you'll see that they have made it there. But chapter 3, I'd like to focus on a little bit, because chapter 3 speaks of the rebuilding of the altar. Now, it's not the rebuilding of the temple just yet, and that's important. Again, when considering the Gospels. Because the altar, if I were to ask you right now, what is the significance of an altar? Sacrifice, right? What are those sacrifices for? When we recall um, the Levitical sacrifices or even ancient sacrifices before the Le Levitical times. Forgiveness, right? On the Day of Atonement every year, what did the people do? Offer to God for forgiveness atonement for their sins. Now, remember this, pre-exilic period. When I say pre-exilic, the days before captivity. The days before they got placed into captivity. Can you spell that? Spell it out, pre-exilic. E-X-I-L-I-C. And uh, we will go over it later on, if, uh, together. Uh, but remember the period of time where they had the temple, where the, one of the most important functions of the temple is to offer at the very altar, to receive assurance that they were forgiven by their covenant Lord at their sincere for, uh, repentance and offering unto God. Now the prophets of the past warned the people, stop getting into a a vain practice of offering but no repenting in heart. But in this, the people, if done sincerely and out of a true repentant heart, their offerings were received by God once they sacrificed those animals on the altar. 
Now, at the very destruction of the first temple, this privilege had been taken away from them. Not only did they lose hope, uh, sorry, did they not only lose their hope in um, everything else that they possessed, such as their homes, uh, maybe even split apart from their families, but they lost the temple and they lost the very altar in which they sacrificed before God, which was... Uh, which brought great devastation to the Jews because how then are we able to properly seek God for forgiveness? Being in Bab uh, Babylon, uh, being in cells and enslaved by them, who among us can build an altar and offer to God freely? No, they will kill us. So I want you to place that in your mind. Their entire religious life is disorganized. It's messy now. Their prayer time is gone. Their offering for forgiveness is gone. Even giving peace offerings to God for mere fellowship is gone. Their scriptures are gone. Their scribes are not accessible to them. Their king is also a captive. Everything is just lost. Therefore, it is not a, su not a surprise to us that when Zerubbabel leads this first wave in chapter 2, that when we get to chapter 3, the very first act that they commit themselves to is the building of an altar. Why not a temple? Why an altar? Why do you think? So there's, would you say that there is a greater need yes. of forgiveness, right? Repentance. Repentance. Any other thoughts? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. Now, why would you think that, why not the temple first, but why the altar? Because in the mind of God, sin has to be atoned for for that. Amen. Right? Sin must be atoned for in order for us to even continue forward in any worship of God. And remember their past. They just came out of a past of great idolatry. But this is a change of heart here, brethren. This is not something that you will read in the previous books. Often it required a prophet or even a righteous king to remind the people. But why is it that when Zerubbabel leads these people back out of their brokenness, their nakedness, um, their poverty, they return back. Now, obviously, Cyrus helps them and they receive everything that they need to rebuild. But now there's this free desire from the people to build an altar to seek God for forgiveness. That's big. After reading all those books that speak of disappointment, you're telling me that God does not only touch the hearts of a pagan king, but he can also touch the hearts of a wicked people and turn them to seek forgiveness? This is the first time that they're offering again to God since captivity. Which is to show us that God has not stopped. Going back to the audience of the chronicler. Has God forgotten us? Has God forsaken his covenant with us? The fact that they built an altar and that God received their sacrifice. Reminds us or reveals to us that God has not stopped forgiving his people. Wow, right? Despite the great sins of his people, he has not stopped. And he is ever willing to forgive. And so that's what you read. The rebuilding of the altar. Really, when you read verse 1, when the seventh month came and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. 
Then arose Jeshua, the son of Josadak, with his fellow priest, and Zerubbabel, the sons of Shiltiel, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of the God of, the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. They could not stop. And they kept the feast of booths, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule as each day required. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings at the new moon, and all, at, at all the appointed feasts of the Lord. Now this is giving us a, a schedule, or sorry, the practice of these people throughout the year. Because they are now observing the feasts. They're observing those days. And at all the appointed feasts of the Lord and the offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food, drink, and oil, to the Sidonians and the Ty uh, Tyri uh, Tyrians, to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea, to Joppa, according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, again, as what was mentioned by our brother earlier, Atonement for sins must be made before we move forward. And this is what you are seeing here in chapter 3. They are not just stuck in offering to God and seeking forgiveness, but they are moving forward. In what? Holiness. And their desire to build a temple for their God. Yes, we have been forgiven, but the foundations for our God's house has not been yet laid. And so they had accumulated for themselves... Uh, the money required to pay the right people from different places of the world that they may come and build and lay the foundations of our Lord's temple. And so a year later, because in verse 8, when you open up, now in the second year after their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, uh, this is when the foundations are laid uh, for the Lord's temple. And you'll read together, now in the second year after they're coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, made a beginning. Together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. Now, I just want to pause there for a moment. I had already mentioned that freely you see now a people willing to build an altar, to God, uh, build an altar for God. But now we also see a people freely willing to build a temple for God. Now, these people are not only led in forgiveness or to forgiveness, but they are being led to serve, to serve. And that's a key theme as well in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah is the service of these people. You'll see that family members upon family members are coming together to serve God. God and His people. And that's important. And so they had appointed the Levites, uh, verse 8, from 20 years old and upward to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And Jeshua with his sons and his brothers and Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah together, supervised the workmen in the house of God, along with the sons of Henadad and the Levites, their sons and brothers. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple the Lord, of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord, according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundations of the house of the Lord was laid. This ought to teach true believers how to sing hymns before God. Amen? Because the foundations of the Lord is laid. This, to us again, is the greater promise. To us again, is the greater experience. It is laid in Christ for us, that solid rock on which we stand. And for us, we ought to respond 
in this way. And here we see that these restored people are not only forgiven, but are freely worshiping and revealing their great joy and gratitude from their hearts as a result of experiencing restoration. And so they praised the Lord because the house of the, Lord, uh, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid, verse 12. But many of the priests and Levites and the heads of the fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. Praise. Adoration of God, worship. Not only are they restored to return to their land, and this is what many Jews fail to see today. They have still the idea that before the Messiah is coming, they will all be sent home to Israel. And this is why you have uh, Western churches uh, accumulating funds to help support Jews going back home, because that's what's in their mind. But in their mind, what they believe is to come back home, to dethrone their oppressors, and to receive back that kingdom that they once had in David. But here we see a greater restoration beyond receiving a land. Restored, forgiven, restored in holiness. Restored in worship of the one and only true God. But it will not be easy. The entire... Uh, these two books do not speak of it as being easy because from chapters 4 to 6, you're going to read of great opposition. There are people from the south that come and say, hey, we are part of you. Uh, but the people of God said, no, we have received this decree from Cyrus himself. He has not told us that you can join us in building this temple. And the people said, well, we are of the God of Israel as well. Why don't you allow us to build? And so they stirred this conflict in the building of the temple. And they, the, the scripture tells us that it keeps on going, really. Cyrus is now dead. Artaxerxes shows up. And um, all the way to Darius' time, really. Uh, we have great rebellion. And so we see a decree of the later uh, king of Persia who says uh, as he is swayed by the people that uh, king if you allow the Jews to keep building their temple they're going to rebel against you and they're not going to give you their tribute and so the king was upset at that and put a, put a temporary cease to the building of the temple um, and this is what you read from chapters 4 to 6. There's opposition even in the worship of the living God. But eventually it, will, it would not last long. Well, it did last long in those days. But uh, according to our reading of the scripture, it would not last long because the build of the temple would be successful during the days of King Darius. Again, he would go back. He would read the decree of King Cyrus and uh, I believe the Lord had turned his heart to continue, allow the Jews to continue their build. And uh, you will read in your Old Testament canon the prophet Haggai or the prophet Zechariah. And their ministries, when you read their books, uh, their ministries are during this time. And the book of Ezra mentions them and their ministry. It says that the people prospered um, at the very prophecies of Haggai and Zechariah and so uh, the Lord had sent even prophets to warn and to proclaim the word of the Lord during those days now as you enter chapter 6 and this is still a part of that first section that we began when you enter chapter 6 verse 13 What we have here is finally this experience of corporate or restored corporate worship of God 
in the context of having a temple. Because in chapter 6, verse 13, uh, the temple is finally rebuilt. And the word of the Lord says, Then according to the word sent by Darius the king, Tatanai, the governor of the province, beyond the river, Shethar Bazanai, and their associates did with all diligence what Darius the king had ordered. And the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. They finished their building by decree of the God of Israel and by the decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And the people of Israel, the priests and Levites, and the rest of the return exiles celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. They offered at the dedication of this house of God a hundred bulls, two hundred rams, four hundred lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, twelve male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. And they set the priests in their divisions, and the Levites in their divisions, for the service of God at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. Pause. We are at the moment that they are celebrating the Lord, but what do you realize again in their offerings in verse 17? The great bloodshed that you see in their celebration. Now the people are serving God. They are working hard. Their efforts are there. But what does verse 17 show us um, when these people are offering so many animals unto God? What did they realize that you and I should realize in reading this? Any idea? Brother James? That no amount of sacrifice that we do will um, completely uh, atone us from the sin. So there is still a sin problem. Okay? That's important. Because people will read only up to here and say, wow, celebration, end of story. But there's still a sin problem because verse 17 testifies to the fact that they must offer regularly unto God. And in their celebration, bloodshed is even necessary because they know there is still sin. So are there any other thoughts that come with that? Are there any other thoughts that may come with uh, that knowledge? Really, what I'm trying to say is the people have come to realize none of our efforts, none of our zeal, our services uh, are enough. Blood is still required. Blood is still required. And I emphasize that because when we get to relating it to the Gospels, that's important. Now, the second section. We've dealt with chapters 1 through 6, but now the second section is chapter 7 to chapter 10, verse 44. Chapter 7 to chapter 10, verse 44. And this is a long time after Zerubbabel. Now we are introduced to the second notable person of the book of Ezra. And his name is? Ezra. And so from chapter 7 to 10, verse 44, this is known as Ezra's ministry. Ezra's ministry. Now, because men are sinful and of the flesh, there is, again, as we've already discussed, a need. Uh, a need for bloodshed, a need to be atoned for. But until that perfect sacrifice comes, men will continually fail against the living God. And it does not help at the fact that the first few years that these exiles have returned to Jerusalem, they don't 
have a library of the ancient text before them. Remember, they're building, they're working their way back. They have the altar, they have the temple, but they do not have men who recall the very law of God in detail. And so the nation still stood in great need of someone who would teach them and guide them and direct them, just like the days of old. They needed a Moses, they needed a Joshua, they needed righteous judges, they needed righteous kings like David and Solomon. They still didn't have this. Though they had Zerubbabel and the loving people, they needed men or a, a man who would guide them in the wisdom of the Lord. Hence, God answers by sending Ezra. And Ezra comes, uh, as we would say, in the second wave of exiles. Ezra would come now to this land of Jerusalem. And his ministry, if you think about the Reformation and the Reformers, you read Ezra and Nehemiah, God used them mightily in such a way that their ministry brought reformation in the minds and the hearts of the Israelite community. Because they had lost the details of holy practice and conduct. For example, intermarrying or intermarriage, having relationships with pagan men and women. Um, the way they handled their children. The way they conducted themselves from day to day. That was all needed to be corrected. They needed to be lined up back to the will of God. And so these people, yes, were restored. Yes, their temple is back. Yes, they're celebrating. But they needed to grow in the knowledge of God's will. They lacked in that great area. And so a reformation was necessary. Uh, go to chapter 9, please, of Ezra, of the book of Ezra, Ezra 9. Now, at this point, Ezra had already instructed the priests of the right way of conduct. Um, fasting and prayer how to handle offerings and now he is correcting the sin of the people of his day chapter 9 after these things had been done the officials approached me and said the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and the chief men has been foremost. As soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. Then all who trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn and fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God, saying, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt. And for our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands. To the sword, to the captivity, to plundering, and to utter shame, as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within his holy place, that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery. For we are slaves... Yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair in its ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. <clears throat> and now, 
O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, The land that you are entering to take possession of it is a land impure, with the impurity of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations that have filled it from end to end, with their uncleanness. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, or our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved and have given us such a remnant as this, Shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor any to escape? O Lord, the God of Israel, you are just, for we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. Amen. And so, again, the hearts of the people are being drawn back to what God has revealed in the past, His will. And I say reformation because really that's what we see. Men, has le men had left that objective truth revealed by God Himself in His Word. And God would send Ezra in the power of His Spirit to... It's like Jesus in the temple, throwing tables at the grief of what has happened. They may have not turned back to their idols, but they have not forsaken those habits that they've learned from their past or their history. And so God would bring them back to what Scripture teaches. And again, remember that these people do not have the five books of the law in their hands for them to go back. And so God in love would provide by giving Ezra this great revelation, this spoken word. And read chapter 10. While Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, a very great assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him out of Israel, for the people wept bitterly. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, the sons of Elam, addressed Ezra, We have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. Therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children, according to the counsel of my Lord, and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for it is your task, and we are with you. Be strong and do it. The, res the very heart and the very response of those who are truly restored, when their ignorance is brought before them and they are exposed for their sins, repentance is the natural response of one who has been turned to God. Let it be done according to our God, according to the law, verse 3. Then, verse 5, Ezra rose and made the leading priests and Levites and all Israel take an oath that they should do as had been said, so they took the oath. And really, that's what you see throughout the entire chapter as the names um, of the guilty are named. Uh, from verses 18 to 44, and Ezra is rebuking their officials. Ezra is rebuking the priests. Ezra is, is, through the Spirit of God, bringing reformation to the very order of Israel. It, it's no different than, again, Jesus in the temple or Paul saying in Romans 6, shall we continue in sin? that grace may abound. Go back to that written word. Go back to the revelation of God. And so the chapter, Ezra, the book of Ezra ends off with the thoughts of reformation, the thoughts of repentance. But even then, you still see the difference between these people and those of the past. 
quick to repent at the revelation of their sins. And so when you open up Nehemiah, we are introduced now to the third wave of exiles who come to Jerusalem. And the next section is Nehemiah chapter 1 uh, to chapter 6, verse 19. Nehemiah 1 to chapter 6, verse 19. And what do we have there? It is the building of the temple wall. And this prayer that we are about to read is exactly what Sister Yvonne was talking about earlier. Nehemiah 1, verse 4. And this is the third notable character that we read in the Ezra Nehemiah books. Verse 4, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was a cupbearer to the king. Now, there you see the desire of Nehemiah in his place to request of God to answer his prayer. And there in chapter 2, is when he raises this request as the king in verse 2, King Artaxerxes asks him, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Now the desire, of course, of Nehemiah is that Yes, the temple and altar are there, but there are, there's nothing to secure it. Enemies can come through. Anything that comes in their way to destroy it or to threaten their temple once again, um, nothing will be there to protect them. And so Nehemiah's desire was a righteous desire because he desired that their worship would be protected, that it would be continuous, that it would always be ongoing, and never hindered. So the work of God in this man's heart uh, to seek this. And yet again, God's working even in the heart of King Artaxerxes uh, to permit him to go and build this temple wall. And so you'll read all about this, the very building of the temple wall. And again, 
Opposition is there. Oppression is there. And then you have that cycle again. The work resumes and they're back to building the walls. Uh, they even accuse Nehemiah. And uh, so that he may be placed underneath the feet of his enemies. But finally, in uh, chapter 6, verse 15, the wall is finished. And uh, it's, scripture records that the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month, Elul, in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and felt greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shekaniah, the son of Ara, and his son Jehonanan, and taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. Also, they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. Again, the desire to destroy that which is in the will of God, the worship of God's people. And so chapters 1 through 6 is the building of the wall. Chapter 7, verse 1 to 72, and you can put 72a, uh, what you'll read here is the restoration of a great large population of Jews. Um, and you read the list. Uh, there's another list of names. And the list that you read in chapter 7 is the list of those who all returned. It is no different than walking in the uh, Holocaust Memorial in Washington and seeing on the, etched on the stones the names of survivors and even the names of those who died. Um, in chapter 7 is the names of those who returned after great destruction. And so 72B of chapter 7 uh, well, really, uh, to make it easier for you, uh, the end of chapter 7 uh, to the end of chapter 10 or 1040, we return back to Ezra's ministry. And you can label this the further reforming of the people under Ezra. And what do the people do now? Well, the people hear further the reading of the law. And you will see a lot of what we do in our worship on the Lord's Day. A lot of those, what we call the regulative principle of worship, a lot of it does come from the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. For example, the reading of scripture in public at, before the assembling of the nation. The response of the people, Amen, Amen, in agreement and confirmation of the things they heard. I do encourage you to go um, to this. And I told you in the beginning that uh, there's so much to talk about in Ezra and Nehemiah. And it's, it would be an entire sermon series just to talk about their leadership and everything they talked about. Which brings us to what we do in our worship of God. But tonight we're focusing on the ultimate theme which is on God and His uh, faithfulness in keeping His promise. And so in chapter 8 or and 9 and 10, uh, all you see here is the continual reformation of the people as the law is given to them. They hear the law. They respond to the law. Um... Uh, verse 2, for example, so Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly. That's the job of a true leader of God's people. That's the job of anyone restored. The duty of anyone who is restored is to bring forth the word of God. 
Verse 5, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great crowd, or the great God, and all the people answered him, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. <clears throat> why, why do you think the people said, Amen, Amen? After Ezra had read those words of the Lord before them. Having been reconciled, they affirm their um, commitment and their testimony of having been reconciled. Amen. God. Amen. And just constantly reading, hearing, and affirming their agreement. Just mm -hmm. like we did. Right, right, right. Any other thoughts? In one accord, uh, because God has done a common work, mm -hmm. not a common work in the sense of common to everyone, right. but in all believers has done that same, very same work. Mm -hmm. They are of one spirit, and therefore they say amen, right. and they know it is true in right. their hearts because God has made it known to them. Amen. Now, do you see here that Nehemiah says to them, and the people said amen? No? But do you know, and this is really for you to know, that pastors shouldn't be telling you to say amen. But the reason why it is necessary for me, which at this point I will stop because it is, if in your heart have been restored by God and have been reconciled to Him, you will respond in affirmation of the things that you have heard and the truths that you have sing to God. And you, brother, and you, sister, will say freely and voluntarily, Amen, and not just Amen, Amen, Amen. And so, Pastor, from this point, I've been waiting to get to Nehemiah at some point. will not ask you to say Amen. Because it is... Freely we say this. And listen, look at the response of these people. He opened the book, he read the book, and they answered, lifting their hands and bowing their heads, worshiping the Lord, faces to the ground. And then Ezra continues on by further un uh, elaborating the importance of the holy day. In chapter 8, um, and the celebrations of feasts, why do we do celebrations unto the Lord? Why do we have specific days unto the Lord? Because perhaps there were people of ignorance in those days that didn't know why their mothers or fathers did what they did. Why did the law indicate this? That we should observe the holy days of the Lord. And as a result of reading from the law, Look at this in at chapter 8, verse 18. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. They kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. And what was the response of the people? Chapter 9, on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth, and with earth on their heads, and the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. And yet people complain that pastor preaches an hour and a half. Oh, this Bible study is past, past my abilities, pastor. These people restored, forgiven, reconciled to God have been reading or read the scripture for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshiped the Lord their God. And yet today, people complain, Pastor, why is there a morning and evening service? I just want, pe I just want you to realize that though this may not be an in immediate prescription in the context of the church that why would we desire anything less 
if they spent a quarter reading to the, reading the scriptures and the other quarter of it in confession and worship unto the Lord their God, why would we desire anything less? And then chapter 9, verse 6. They make their confession, or really at the end of verse 5, uh, as they mention the names of uh, the priests. Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name which is exalted above all blessing and praise. If pastors would just read this, they would, if called by God, would lead their people in this way. The ministry of the priest, the ministry of any leader placed under God's authority should lead their people, stand up and bless the Lord your God. From everlasting to everlasting, blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone, you have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the hosts of heavens, or heaven, worships you. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, and gave him the name of Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you, and made with him the covenant to give uh, to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite. And you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. And it just keeps on going. It takes them and their experience in Egypt. It takes them to the time of Moses and their difficulties in the wilderness. Even in the days that their fathers acted presumptuously against the Lord. Verse 16 and stiffened their necks and did not obey God's commandments. They recall their sins. Verse 32. Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. Our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you gave them, even in their own kingdom, and amid your great goodness that you gave them. And in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves. And its rich yield goes to the king whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please. And we are in great distress. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. And on the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. They are doing what we would call extreme, but what is necessary in committing themselves to the Lord. And again, you have the list of names of those who are sealed under this document, this what we call covenant before God. Just like a pastor would vow to the congregation his service, or a pastor who would be ordained, or a deacon who would be placed in office, or a new member that would be brought and welcomed into the congregation would vow out of that sacredness, that seriousness, this is the way it was treated. We sinned against you. Our father sinned against you. But we desire that we would live right in our worship of you. And so seal our names in this covenant. And so that's what you have till the end of chapter 10. And remember the prayers um, in verse 38 of chapter 9. Uh, sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. And so in chapter 11 uh, to 13, uh, verse 3, you will have the list of leaders and the list of priests. And... Um,
and and then latter in chapter at the end of chapter 12 and 13 is uh, those works of Nehemiah that are recorded such as the dedication of the temple um, our temple wall sorry and the appointing of men for service at the temple And so we finally reach the end of chapter 13, and I, we have not done any justice to these two books. So you have the joy of going back and studying these on your own, and the Lord willing, we would go over these books together, verse by verse, maybe when we finish Genesis at some point. Uh, but we finally reach the end, chapter 13, in chapter 13, verse 4, literally in your Bibles, and there, there may be a caption there or the title of the heading. It says, Nehemiah's Final Reforms. And this is exactly what it is. Uh, this is the final work of reformation under the administration of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah follows the same pattern of Ezra. He opens the book, he, can, he exposes the sins of the people, and he points them back to the law of Almighty God. And that's what you have till the end of verse 31. Now, read with me as we close verse 29 of chapter 13 it says remember them O my God because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites and so what has happened sin thus I cleanse them from everything foreign and I establish the duties of the priests and Levites each in his work and I provided for the wood offering at appointed times and for the first fruits, remember me, O oh my God, for good. When the people turned back to sin, the faithful God in Nehemiah continued to proclaim the law of God, even when priests have desecrated the very holy things and committed abominations before the Lord. Nehemiah and the might of the Lord pointed them back to serve the almighty and holy God. And what we have at the end of this book is nothing compared to what we've read at the end of most of the books we've gone through, at least in the sections that we would end off with the nation sinning against God. But here we end with a people in a state where we thought we would never expect them to be here. In the Chronicles, they were at a decline, but here they are restored. They are ordered back into the proper worship of the living and true God, back in the city that God had given David. Certainly, Chronicles ended with hope, but Ezra and Nehemiah is the, tr is the experience of God's faithfulness in keeping, up, keeping with his promise. Oh, the hope. Being that this time or this, these books speak of the latter of the Old Testament history, and then we enter into the 400 years of silence and the great fall of the Jews into rabbinical tradition. And we open up in the Gospels with scribes and Pharisees. But do you see the faithfulness of God to turn this nation around? Because he's preparing them for something, someone greater than Ezra and Nehemiah. And with regards to the New Testament, 
What the book of Ezra and Nehemiah cry out is hope for Adam's lost race. Why? Because if God can turn kings and nations in order to fulfill his promises, providing restoration, worship, restoration in having communion with God, and the nation's hearts are turned back to him in holiness, repentance, then certainly after meditating upon Ezra and Nehemiah, even on the surface, reveal to us that God can provide that prophesied Messiah that is to come, in our point of view, has already come. That prophesied Messiah who will restore sinful man back to himself, who would not just overpower or overthrow kings, but even the king of darkness and the very darkness of men's hearts and change man's heart and give him life. Remember, we opened this study understanding that no man, no power on earth or heaven can stop God from fulfilling his promises. His initial promise in Genesis 3.15 is redemption. And the reason why, even despite restoration, rebuild of temple and temple wall, that there's still bloodshed, because no matter the zeal, the effort, and the service that these priests these Levites, these brave men are doing and committing themselves to, they are still guilty. And unless a perfect sacrifice is to come, they will continue in that pattern over and over and over again. It can only go so far, human efforts. Man needs redemption from sin. And there are hints given to us already. Uh, for example, like the building of the temp uh, sorry, the altar. The fact that the altar was built before the re temple rebuilt or rebuilt reveals to us that God is hinting that a day is coming when He will receive worship outside of a man-made building. That's big. The fact that an altar was rebuilt before a temple, God is hinting that worship one day will be, and it really was never in a place anyway. But God is pointing us there by reading Ezra and Nehemiah. Worship will be without a building, but it would be in a temple washed by the blood of Christ, purchased by the blood of Christ. When the Romans come in later, the temple is destroyed, the walls are destroyed. Altars are gone, the temples are gone, the walls of protection are gone. Because it's hinting to the answer of them all being in Christ, who would make for himself a temple through the offering of his own life, purchasing his sheep and redeeming them, we being the temple of God's Holy Spirit. What about the protection? What about the walls? There is no need of it because he has secured us in that perfect and great sacrifice and perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ where enemies cannot come in or threats may come but can never take away what God has done in Christ. Lastly, the reformation of the people by Ezra and Nehemiah's leadership teach us of the true outcome of those who've been genuinely restored by God. Again, once lost, helpless, hopeless, now restored, serving God, hearing His words with desire and hunger and thirst, repenting of sins and obedience to our God. What is our excuse? Just like what we learned last Lord's Day evening. In the covenant of works, now that we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, out of love we are 
commanded to obey. Tonight we, come, we go home with the same thought. In Christ we live. Who is the very word that Ezra and Nehemiah pointed the people to. And in him we live. And he has enabled us to live as those restored people. Never again turn, being taken away. So brethren, do not marvel when we go through reformations. Or then when reformations come upon us. For as it says <clears throat> at the end of Nehemiah, God is, if we were to put God in that text, placing Nehemiah for God, God is really responsible in the cleansing of the people. If reformation comes upon us, it is because God is cleansing us from everything foreign and is establishing us in his priestly service that we would live as those truly restored sons and daughters of the Lord Jesus Christ. So praise be to God that he has a remnant. Praise be to God that his scripture is being read. Praise be to God that we are able to sing the truths that we sing. For this is only possible by, by the hands of a gracious, almighty God. And I pray that you go home tonight with such reverence before him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening that you have given us your precious words in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage the brethren to even read these chapters, these books, that they may see your faithfulness in keeping your promise. Certainly, the joy has filled our hearts in knowing that if you could provide restoration for a helpless people, and that these books do intend to bring into our hearts and minds that you fulfill your promises much more than our joy should be filled that we live in a time that we've experienced the Lord Jesus Christ in seeing that you surely did and have fulfilled your promise. And even now in the state of being justified, how much more then will you fulfill our glorification when you return? Cleanse us then from all foreign objects, from all foreign ideas, from all pagan thoughts, from idols of this world. Bring us to your word and remember us, O God, as we point your people to your word and as your people obey you. Preserve us, O God. Be merciful to us. In Jesus' name, amen.